to introduce Robert Einstein, who is going to tell us about. I think I've seen this iceberg picture already. Yeah. Wait for the wait for the leprosy Okay. Are you stealing me good stuff? Okay. I'll let you speak. Thank you. Thank you. Over the last 16 years, I've become increasingly concerned that map is a major human pathogen responsible for far more than Crohn's disease. You need to start off with the understanding that most of us think of diseases as being unimodal, but consider they might be bi or even polymodal. The best example of which, the best example of which is leprosy, which at least was described in 1874, and we had a lovely introduction to it earlier today. There was a study published in Science in about 1992 out of Modlin's group at Einstein, where they looked at the cytokine profiles in the two forms of leprosy. And in eight patients, four in each group, they showed a differential pattern. And I'll just show you one of them if I can. Yeah. Um, this is interleukin 1 beta. And you will see, uh, you actually don't know which group it is, but you will see one group has a pro inflammatory cytokine response and the other group does not. And it turns out that the pro inflammatory cytokine group is associated with the more indolent form of the disease. My brother out of Mount Sinai, New York, Crohn's Hospital, published a paper where he suggested there were two forms of Crohn's disease, which he called perforating and non perforating. They have completely different clinical presentations. And what he showed was that if you follow them serially, the second operation predominantly tended to be for the same problem as the first operation. There was a huge number of patients, and although it's been replicated in the data, that is still the largest series ever published. So we decided to test the hypothesis that there might be a similar difference in cytokine profiles in the two forms of Crohn's. This is how we did the experiment. We took four patients who were controls, we took four fistulizing Crohn's, and we took four obstructive Crohn's, isolated the RNA, not DNA, the RNA, did cDNAs on it, and then we did a variety of PCRs on them. This is the housekeeping gene beta lactam, and you're really not going to get a better control than that. And then the, for the rapidity, I'm only showing you one of the results, and suffice it to say, that the non-perforating form, the obstructive form of Crohn's disease, the more indolent form, just like with tuberculoid leprosy, has a pro-inflammatory cytokine response. This is the montage that we published with uh, all of the appropriate controls and showing, for example, interleukin-6 is also upregulated in Crohn's, which had previously been published. <laughs> and we concluded that there was an enhanced immune response in the obstructive form and a decreased immune response in the fistulizing form. I did nothing more for two years, and then someone wanted to learn molecular techniques, and this, to my mind, is going to be a pivotally important study, and the upper three blots and the lower blot are just controls. This is the guts, it's the IS-900, and you will see on the right that all of the Crohn's patients who detected paratuberculosis DNA, well, RNA. Additionally, previously I'd said we looked at controls. But you will see that there were two patients with UC and two with cancer. And both of the patients with UC also had paratuberculosis RNA. I didn't want to get involved with it at the time, so in the discussion I actually said, this manuscript does not address the significance of the positive signal seen in the ulcerative colitis. We showed the DNA sequence that it was paratuberculosis, and about eight years later, Sally Nasser confirmed our findings by culturing paratuberculosis from the blood of both Crohn's and UC, but not non-IBD controls. In that last PNAS paper, we also showed 
the result of it had been isolated from the potable water supply of Los Angeles was in fact paratuberculosis. I did nothing for about another six years. And then, while at a meeting, I saw this triangle, which is the therapeutic triangle which is used in both rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease. And the thought occurred to me that the entire medical profession is wrong. And that the bottom, the bottom of the slide is in fact the aminosalicylates should in fact be analyzed in this way. That the bottom might very well have anti-paratuberculosis activity. It's just the world doesn't call it that. So the rest of the talk will be on the inhibition studies which we subsequently did. These are our methods. We used the Bactec system and shown on the right are all of the uh, strains that we looked at, they are essentially a variety of paratuberculosis and then avium and we have two bias level 2 tuberculosis complexes. The story begins in 1942 when Nana introduced sulfasalazine. Sulfasalazine is cleaved in the gut into sulfapyridine, which is an acknowledged antibiotic, and 5-ASA, which is called and anti-inflammatory because inflammation goes down when you use it. At the top you see the molecule for salicylic acid. On the bottom right, if you add an amino group, you get para amino salicylic acid, the first mass-produced anti-tuberculosis medication. If you switch the amino group from 4 to 5, you could call it meta amino salicylic acid, but it's called 5-ASA instead. And I will just tell you in our studies, 5-ASA is about a thousand-fold less effective than PAS as an anti-tuberculosis medication. All of the data I'll be presenting is presented this way. Along the ordinate, you have the cumulative growth index. And along the abscissa, you have uh, the concentration of the agent we were testing. I want you to look at only two lines here. The white line is the negative control, it is the intact molecule of salicylic acid. The red line shows dose-dependent inhibition by 5-ASA. On this slide, the two upper panels are paratuberculosis, showing dose-dependent inhibition. It's subtle, but it's there. In contrast with avian, the red line shows no inhibition whatsoever. The sulfasalazine conclusions are 5-ASA alone, and in combination causes dose-dependent decrease in that, but not MAVN growth, and sulfapyridine alone has little if any independent action. Methotrexate is used in high doses to treat cancer and in low doses as an immune modulator to treat diseases such as Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis in a very low dose. In this slide, uh, you've got the positive and negative controls. The red line is methotrexate. The white line is 6MP. The Collins lab has replicated these data with 6MP and its precursor, azathioprine. There is a major difference in the, set, in the susceptibility in the lab, and this mirrors what happens clinically. 5-ASA is used in a dose of 28,000 milligrams a week and methotrexate at 25 milligrams a week. Thalidomide is now being used again in clinical medicine because it works. In high doses, it's used in cancer chemotherapy, and in low doses, it's used to treat a variety of so-called inflammatory diseases and leprosy and acknowledged mycobacterial disease. If you look at the molecule of thalidomide, you can in fact see there are two moieties to it. You can buy thalidomide without a problem. We couldn't find any paparidine 2 6 diamond. We were able to purchase the last 15 milligrams available on the planet Earth of uh, hydroxypaparidine 2 6 diamond from the rare chemical library at Aldrich. The two upper panels show the, the purple line is the hydroxypaparidine diamond moiety. 